So anyway, welcome everyone to our uh, Miami Blue membership meeting. Uh, it's nice to be able, one of, I guess, one of the advantages of a COVID and Zoom calls is we can have people far flung and attend our meeting. So we appreciate all of you who are members of other chapters and our uh, fearful leader, Jeff, to join us uh, today. Uh, we've got a very uh, packed program. Uh, the agenda is up for your perusal. Uh, and Jason, why don't you take the lead and introduce uh, Mariana Wright, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our November quarterly meeting of 2020. And let me introduce our guest speaker. So uh, today we have uh, Mariana Wright. She is the executive director for the National Butterfly Center. Um, today she's gonna present on the butterflies and plants along the Texas-Mexico -Mexi border. Um, if you have been seen it, she was featured in a film called I Eat Mariposa, and she has a, a, a great story um, regarding the center, her life, all that good stuff. And I just wanna show you in particular, if you look at the two maps, um, one is just where the National Butterfly Center is located. And I just want you to see that it's located along the border um, and somewhat near the Gulf of Mexico, but not quite. But the real grande uh, is in the vicinity of this area too. So um, without further ado, um, Mariana Wright, thank you for um, joining today's quarterly meeting. Thank you for having me. I'm gonna share my screen here, which is gonna bump you off. Makes me a little nervous now that Jeff is here. I'm sure he's muted, he's smiling. Um, so let me tell you guys a little bit about the National Butterfly Center. I assume almost everyone understands this is your project. Um, the NABA membership supports the National Butterfly Center where your only physical plant, your only bricks and mortar um, location were 100 acres on the Rio Grande River on the border to Mexico in the lower Rio Grande Valley. And uh, as legend has it, Jeff used to bring people to visit the lower Rio Grande Valley because there are more birds and butterflies located in this four county region than anywhere else in the United States. So the volume and the diversity of species is incredible. And he thought, uh, wouldn't it be great to have a place in South Texas that was open year round to receive people and uh, do the butterfly show and tell. And he took his tour group and they went to the Mission Chamber of Commerce where he met uh, Viola Espinosa, told her this idea and she said, well, that sounds really interesting. Uh, let's see what we can do to make that happen. And introduced him to several people in town and we have the National Butterfly Center now, uh, almost 20 years later. And so um, I've been here since 2012, July of 2012. I was not a butterflyer when I began. And actually when y'all reached out to ask me to present, I misunderstood and thought you wanted me to talk about butterflyers um, who are certainly uh, an interesting group of people that I have enjoyed getting to know along with the butterflies over the last eight years. So you notice that woman in the picture back there was wearing the blue version of the monarch wings. And I believe that was in recognition of the Mexican blue wing. This is our logo emblem and a target species for everyone who visits the National Butterfly Center. Its host plant is the Vasey Zedalia. It's a tree and we have them planted throughout the property. We're always adding more just to do what we can to ensure that everyone who visits gets to see this spectacular butterfly. There's some butterfly species that we share uh, with Florida, with various parts of Florida. I understand the Ornithian is one of those, but um, 
your identification skills will be pushed with these large yellow and black swallowtails when you encounter the broad banded, for example, which can also be found at the National Butterfly Center. We have others like the polydamus. This one was actually photographed in my backyard recently. I started planting for butterflies after I started working for the National Butterfly Center. So you've already made a small impact right there with me. But we also have the ruby spotted swallowtail. We had one just this week at the National Butterfly Center. The red sided swallowtail and the pink spotted swallowtail. Those are some rare and ultra rare swallowtails you might be able to see in the lower Rio Grande Valley and at the National Butterfly Center. I know we share some sulfurs, some whites and yellows, like the sleepy orange, but we have the tailed orange. You have to come to South Texas to see that one. And almost all of these are my own photos. I don't do much to alter them. I know this one was caught in the shade and some photos will be better than others. So please forgive me. Here we have a yellow angled sulfur, one of the really large ones that's also uh, peculiar to this part of the world and the white angled sulfur. And many of these seem to show up during the Texas Butterfly Festival, which occurs at this time each year. But they could be around more often. We just don't have that Patagonia effect going. The more eyes we have out there searching, the more likely we are to find these butterflies that really thrill people. Among the small yellows, we have the mimosa. We also have the Dina and the Bois Duval, which you do not have in Florida at this time, at least to my knowledge. So I loosely organize these uh, by families, but I do jump around. So I don't follow the field guide in order. I hope that uh, that doesn't make any OCD types crazy. Blues, you guys have the Eastern Pygmy and we have the Western Pygmy Blue. This little guy was super cooperative. I actually think I took this one with my cell phone, which if you've tried to photograph the little ones, you know, is not very easy. Um, while we share butterflies like Cassius, we also have Rekerts and Sina, which you do not have. Things to brush up on if you're planning a trip to Texas. We also have the silver banded hair streak and I love green butterflies. I don't know what it is about them, but we've got a, a handful of them that you can see at the center, um, like Zami, which used to only appear in Cameron County and has now been uh, more inland in Hidalgo County. We've actually had it at the National Butterfly Center, even though we do not have their host plant. Uh, we've also got Talia, clenches, and the tropical um, hair streaks, which are green little boogers also. We have many hair streaks like you do, like the ubiquitous gray hair streak. But we have a lot of scrub hair streaks in addition, like the lantana scrub hair streak. Then there's a really rare uh, tailless scrub hair streak that is a, a cousin to this one. And everybody tries to turn the lantana into a tailless, but it's really unusual. I've never seen one. We have uh, a distinct mallow scrub hair streak from the one you have in Florida that does not have um, as large and bright and colorful an orange red spot there on the tail um, like yours does. But we have other distinct uh, scrub hair streaks that you don't have 
the white scrub hair streak, Lacey's scrub hair streak, and the Yohoa. A few years ago, three or four years ago, during the Texas Butterfly Festival, we had more than a dozen hair streaks accounted for, and people were running around chasing them. We've never had that many hair streaks on the property and around the property as we did uh, that year. We also have Marius, which looks almost identical to a gray hair streak, only it has a gray eye. And so you wade through a whole lot of gray hair streaks looking for a Marius. Dusky blue ground streak, a tiny little one that we take for granted. You have red banded, we have this guy. And we also have the ruddy hair streak. It is much more uncommon than this dusky blue. Another one you have to sort through a whole lot of to find. And then we have mini streaks like Clyde, which is not uncommon. You have good chance of seeing a Clyde when you come to the National Butterfly Center. But we also have Gray and Vicroy's mini streaks, much less common and difficult to find because they are itty bitty. They can be about the size of your pinky fingernail. Then we have this gorgeous, gorgeous creature, a tropical uh, butterfly that has now appeared at the National Butterfly Center three times, I believe. This one was in June, July this summer, and we got to spend a lot of quality time with it. It hung around, we got photos, we got video. We got a chance to send out uh, an alert as we always do and people were able to drive and get there and see it. It first appeared or its first documented record in the United States also occurred as part of the Texas Butterfly Festival. One day we had one appear at the National Butterfly Center and one appear at an RV park down the road from us. So there were actually two that day on that record first US sighting. These are the kind of butterflies we tell people uh, bring out the, the traffic and etiquette police at the National Butterfly Center because we can't have you running anyone over trying to get to that butterfly or pushing them out of the way to get your sighting and your, your picture. The red bordered pixie is often another target butterfly for people coming to visit. Its host plant is the guamuchil tree, which people now commonly just call the pixie tree because it is the host. In this photo, you can see its chrysalis empty right beneath the butterfly, if you look there. So this one had recently a closed and uh, we had spent time with it as it unfurled its wings and got its blood pumping. Uh, lots of people refer to this as one of the Cheshire cat butterflies, but I call it the velvet Elvis because it reminds me of the black velvet uh, very colorful paintings we used to see in the marketplace in Mexico when I was growing up, many of them of Elvis Presley. Red bordered metal marks. You guys have a little metal mark, but we have the fatal and the rounded and the falcate and the curve winged and also the blue metal mark. The blue one is a spectacular um, blue and it is a Cameron County butterfly. It has never yet been seen at the National Butterfly Center to my knowledge, um, but it has started to appear in Hidalgo County in uh, the far um, eastern southern part of Hidalgo County. So we're hoping that it might make its way to us. So we both have zebra heliconians 
And in some parts of Florida, you have Julia. We have Julia, but we also have Isabella's and Banded Orange. And I have seen an Isabella. I do not have good pictures of one. And I've never seen a Banded Orange. We also have the Erato Heliconian. This is my nemesis butterfly. When it first started appearing uh, at the National Butterfly Center since my tenure began, it would only appear in June or July. It didn't matter when in June or July, it appeared as soon as I left the county to take my children to summer camp without fail for three or four years in a row. Uh, its first record at the National Butterfly Center uh, was in November. And last year, I believe several appeared in December. This is actually a member's photograph. This is Kathy Detweiler's. She took this one at Benson State Park right down the road from us. Fritillaries. We share gulf and variegated, but we have the Mexican fritillary. This is another photo taken in my yard, I believe. And we also have Mexican silver spot, which looks a whole lot like a gulf fritillary, but it's missing some white spots. So we keep our eyes peeled for that. It's much less common, although um, maybe more common if we would pay more attention to all the Gulf fritillaries. But that's another one we kind of take for granted and overlook when we're out in the gardens. The Texan Crescent is moving to Florida, or at least it appears to across the range map, moving its way into y'all's panhandle. But we also have the Pale Banded Crescent. And uh, I, we've also got a Vesta Crescent, which is uh, not found in Florida. And I have completely neglected in this presentation all of the checker spots. But we have Fiona and Elada, which are pretty common. You're practically guaranteed to see those when you come. And I've also neglected all of the patches, like our bordered patch, Crimson Patch, Rosita, Definite, and Banded Patch. So if you're a list keeper, you can check off a whole bunch of patches when you come visit. The Common Mestra. This is such a lovely little butterfly with a uh, an interesting flight pattern and they like the woodland edges and they tend to fly pretty low. Their host plant is stinging nettle. And once you find a patch of that, you will never forget it. And you'll always remember where to go in search of common mestra. We have red rim. It is uncommon, but does tend to make an appearance every year during the Texas Butterfly Festival as if it drops in just to thrill our visitors. And then we have ultra rarities like the common banner, which have also been seen at the National Butterfly Center. A couple of butterflies that can be found in Florida that we share like the tropical buckeye and the malachite are not ubiquitous. I mean, you can find them, but you really have to search for them. We had uh, two weeks ago, I think, at least four malachites in the gardens at once. And that has only happened one other time in the last eight years. It was pretty exciting. People running around to check out all four of them. We have uh, emperors, as do you, but you do not have the silver emperor or the pavon emperor. 
we've got sisters too, including band celled and spot celled. And I forgot to mention banded peacock when we were there with the, the malachites. All of these are butterflies that you are likely to see on a day out with the exception of the silver and pavon emperors. Those are still really rare sightings. Blumfield's Beauty, it is a large butterfly. And when you see it, you realize it's something you may not know, but you know you've never seen before. And in my first many years of butterflying at the National Butterfly Center and elsewhere, uh, that's how I came to learn things. And that's always a thrill even now. We have folks who will take me out butterflying, and I think they only use me for that. I've never seen this before because it does, uh, it does cause them to perk up, even the most experienced butterflyers. Sometimes it's something they've seen a million times, like an Empress Lelia, but sometimes it is not. And uh, there was a NABA meeting in... Kentucky, I believe, where I found the chase butterfly. And my camera had died and my tablet had died. So I didn't get a picture, but there was another person with me. So it was, there were two witnesses to this butterfly. And uh, we reported it when we got back. And that night at happy hour, someone uh, walked up to me and he said, Hey, I heard they saw this butterfly. I can't even remember the name of it, but Jeff can add it to the chat if he remembers. And, um, but, but they say that the woman who found it is notoriously unreliable. And I said, yeah, that was me. And uh, uh, Dean and Sally Jew did go out that same day after we had called it in and they relocated the butterfly. So I was vindicated which I guess only matters to uh, insecure and hyper experienced butterflyers. <laughs> so you guys have ready dagger wings and we have ready also and mini banded dagger wings, but we also have the waiter, which is ultra rare, one I have never seen and the rusty tipped page, which has appeared at the National Butterfly Center, and I did get a chance to see that. The ready and mini banded dagger wings, we assume have to be around most of the time, but your best chance of seeing them on the property is always when the brush holly blooms. This is a tree that only blooms after rainfall and it has to be a pretty significant rainfall and it only blooms then for two days day three it's waning and and things may not be so good but we put out the alert that the brush holly is blooming and people come running and they bring chairs so they can sit around the chair the the tree and wait to see the mini banded and ruddy dagger wings, often both on the tree at the same time. Another ultra rarity, and this was the photograph taken by a former member. Um, this is the Orion Cecropian, and this was its first uh, appearance in the United States that was documented. And uh, it happened at the National Butterfly Center. This is another large, uh, surprisingly large butterfly. And we have lots of tropical and goat weed leaf wings, and they tend to congregate on the butterfly feeders, these bait logs that we put out in the woodland areas. And once you understand that you could find something unusual or even a first, like a one-spotted propona or uh, an angled or pale spotted leaf wing or a Guatemalan or a, an Orion Cecropian, you do take the time 
to examine the bait logs. Even though chances are you're going to see a hundred hackberry and tawny emperors, maybe a hundred tropical leaf wings and nothing else. But we have also had angled and pale spotted show up. The pale spotted leaf wing was discovered as part of the Texas Butterfly Festival a couple of years ago. Crackers. This is a photo by Craig Lipsky. He's one of our members and this was one of the photos he submitted for the North American Butterfly Photo Contest, which we do every year as part of the Texas Butterfly Festival. And the crackers appear at the National Butterfly Center and you have to hunt for them generally, unless you walk past one and it goes flying by, they're practically impossible to spot. And you want to see them because we have gray crackers and we have Guatemalan crackers. Um, there's a Guatemalan, and you can see the red bar right there on its shoulder. This is one of my photos. And they all hang out upside down like this. But we also have Glaucus, and we have had Variable, and there's been one red cracker in the Rio Grande Valley. So it's another one. Once you see one, you tend to see more. The gray and the Guatemalan often show up at the same time. We don't know why. And uh, you want to sort through all of them in case you get something special. White striped long tail. These are uncommon in the Rio Grande Valley. They're around. You may see one. Um, I've even had them in my yard but they're always so pretty. To me, they look like they're dressed up in a tuxedo. And you always wanna stop and check them out because you might be looking at something else. And then we have our brown long tails, which like our bordered patches are everywhere practically all the time. And we take them for granted, but visitors, to the center and, and during the festival are always excited to see them. And it is the one thing I, I say may provoke an, oh, really? You're excited by a brown long tail? But uh, they can be quite pretty. And we look at them because you might be seeing uh, Talias or another uh, much, much less common version of a brown long tail type butterfly. This is a Zilpa long tail, which is one of those that, uh, you know, when you see the white stripe long tail, you check out the white on it to make sure that, that uh, you're seeing the right butterfly. This one has lost most of its tail. Um, but we also have white crescent long tail which would look almost sort of like this. And then tailless or almost tailless as this one is, you could be looking at an emerald aguna or a gold spotted aguna. So we do still check out our long tails, but mostly only if they have white on them. And I probably shouldn't be confessing that. There's also a possibility that you're looking at something like a mercurial skipper. It looks like it maybe has its tails, its long tails broken off, but it does not. And this is a big skipper, one that brings ooh and ah. And again, you check these out when they arrive because they're so lovely. And you could have something extremely uncommon like a broken silver drop. And just a couple of weeks ago, one of our members who lives a few blocks from me and has been planting for butterflies for the last few years, she photographed a broken silver drop in her yard. And we're always joking like, hey, send that over here, send it to my house back and forth. 
Uh, but it's wonderful to have neighbors now who are also planting for butterflies and we're starting to bring some really good stuff into town. Another one of those wonderful skippers that you know you see and think that could have lost its tail is the falcate skipper. I photographed this one on the hat of Maxie Lou Link. She is in her 90s and she loves butterflies. I don't think she did until she met Dr. Glassberg. She just uh, this year retired as president of the Upper Valley Art League, which she helped to found. And she pioneered our butterfly landmark project, which has made giant fiberglass butterflies with uh, built-in seating. And those are, put all around the city of Mission. So some cities have dolphins or like Houston has the cows. Um, we have butterflies around Mission thanks to Maxie Lou Link. And again, you look at all of these big skippers because they're beautiful, but also you're looking for two barred flashers or its cousin, the Gilberts or the Frosted which is really rare. Uh, and perhaps, you know, people who've seen them all hold out hope for things like the small spotted and all of these are large black and blue skippers like this without tails. The host plant for the two barred flasher is coyotillo. And so we have a bed full of coyotillo with a butterfly sign Am I on again? Okay, my mic went off. The mic went off. I don't know, but I'm back on. Okay. Um, it's back on. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in this bed with the coyotillo, we have a sign about the host plan and the butterfly. And the butterfly often lands on the sign. So people joke that we've trained our butterflies to land. You'll get the same thing sometimes with the pixies or with the Mexican blue wings. And that's become sort of a goal for people is to photograph the butterfly on its sign. The two barred flasher tends to show up late in the afternoon at the National Butterfly Center. So it has been named the four o'clock flasher. And it's funny to see people's faces when they don't know what you're talking about, but visitors are in the pavilion or in the gardens asking if the four o'clock flasher has made his appearance yet. Guava skipper. These are gorgeous and their host plant is the guava tree. It's a tropical fruit tree that we have uh, in South Texas. And so we have the butterfly. It is almost always on, on someone's target list. If they don't have it on the list, it's because they don't know about it. And um, one, one year after the um, Texas Butterfly Festival, I went with a group of our regulars. Some people come and stay for a week or a month uh, during November because the butterflying is so good. Uh, and I took them actually to Valley Nature Center in Westlaco. And we found a guava skipper and everybody was, you know, stepping up like two at a time to take their pictures, very polite, well organized. And just as the last two people stepped up to take their pictures out from under the bush, hopped a toad that ate the guava skipper. And everybody screamed, you, you would have thought something really terrible had happened but for us it was it was pretty bad spread wing skippers if you photograph butterflies i'm sure you've all had this experience this experience where you see one and you're like oh my gosh i need that i want to get this gorgeous photo and the butterflies are uncooperative 
in this case, I wound up with a twofer. I never did get the Texas powdered skipper on its own. But here we have two South Texas spread wing skippers. Uh, in addition to the Texas powdered skipper, we have the sickle wing skipper. And uh, these are our list butterflies. The sickle wing much more common than the uh, Texas powdered skipper, but we also have a common streaky skipper that people look for um, and dusky wings like Horace's mournful and funereal uh, that are uh, these dark spread wing skippers. I should have included a photo of the blue studded skipper, which is an ultra rarity. And it's one found by Luciano, who is the photographer for the National Butterfly Center. He found it on one of the Texas Butterfly Festival field trips and photographed it, but didn't say anything because he didn't know what it was. He knew he'd never seen it, but because he didn't speak up then, Nobody else got to see it. So if you see something, say something in the world of butterflying. Uh, fortunately, several other people did take pictures of it. So his sighting was well documented, but it was a, a big disappointment that when people went back to that site uh, in an attempt to relocate the butterfly, it, it was not done. White patch skipper. I think these are so lovely. And another one that you're likely to see at the National Butterfly Center. In saying that, I will confess that I am not showing a whole bunch of other uh, skippers with white on them, like Laviana and Erickson's Turk's Cap, East Mexican, White Veined, and Alana. The Alana was found at the National Butterfly Center by the legendary Mike Ricard a couple of years ago. And it's been in the header image of the Texas Butterfly Festival website for quite some time. I am also not showing the checkered skippers. And that's because I gave up trying to identify them. <laughs> <laughs> there are quite a few, and you have to photograph them and try to get underside and open, and then I at least still have to review them in my field guide and hope that they are textbook butterflies. The golden-headed scallop wing is an LBJ, a little brown jobber that I like and I can identify because guess what? It has a golden head. <laughs> I like the butterflies that make it easy, but we've got several fantastic um, spread wing skippers as, as you're seeing. Um, and there was one more that I had meant to mention with this one. If Jeff's audio wasn't muted, I'm sure he'd be chiming, chiming in and, and mentioning all kinds of others. But um, this is the last of my, of my skippers. You may notice that I have not shown a single grass skipper. And that's because there are dozens and dozens and dozens of those. And I haven't chosen to focus on them. I have been lazy and I resort to the default when in doubt, whirl about. And that's largely because they can be so variable. But um, we could do an entire uh, slideshow presentation just on grass skippers of the lower Rio Grande Valley. I mentioned the Texas Butterfly Festival many times. I do hope that if you have not attended, you will plan to. Hopefully in 2021, we'll all be able to gather safely again. But it's three days of field trips to dozens of sites, both public and private properties, some of which you may have no access to except as part of the festival. 
and we keep the trips relatively small so that you can all gather and get your photographs and, and have a good time out there. The camaraderie is such that we have many people who return year after year. It's kind of like a, a family reunion. And as I mentioned, many people stay for the full week or even the full month if they are able. So this is the end of my Butterflies of the Rio Grande Valley presentation. Do we have questions? Jay, are you gonna unmute everybody or how do we do this? I think they can unmute themselves. So I see uh, uh, participants have, have already done that. So Barbara, you actually wrote a question in the chat. Can you repeat that question? Oh, yes. You were talking about the, um, the fiberglass uh, butterfly seats. <laughs> um, I wondered if they're available for sale. They might be kind of big to ship, but could be really interesting in some of our parks and butterfly gardens. They, um, I would imagine they would make them and ship them in town. Uh, I believe they're like $750 for people to commission and have made and um, located, you know, on their property or somewhere else. So someone may sponsor one and have it put in a school or um, at their church or something. But yeah, I mean, I can certainly put you in touch with the Upper Valley Art League or the City of Mission uh, to see who's handling that now. City of Mission, just wrote that down. I'll, I'll go hunting. Upper Valley Arts, what? Upper Valley Art League. Very cool. All right. I, I don't have a- Do we have any other comments from the audience? Go ahead. I wanted to, to just make a comment. Does, did, is this, did you record this so that it could be, because I've had like several texts from people who were very angry because they couldn't get in today. Um, and yeah, you know, this, they're, uh, they're wanting to know if they could, it. you know, could see a recording of it because they really wanted to hear Mariana's talk. Yes, it's recorded. All right, do we have any other questions or comments uh, about the presentation or, you know, talk directly to Mariana? This is the time to do it. I enjoyed that, Mariana, because I'm really missing the Texas butterflies. I should be there right now. I know, and I just got a text from Luciano and Stephanie. They're out scouting because we're doing private uh, field trips for people who were determined to come in spite of COVID. And uh, they found silver banded hair streaks at Ignacio's place. And I think you got to oh. go there last year. It's yes. a private residence. And he's been planting for butterflies since he found out about the National Butterfly Center. Cause we, we have a native plant nursery as well. So we, we sell the plants to people that they see at the butterfly center so they can replicate our success. I'd like to thank you, Mariana, for uh, doing this presentation for us. It was really wonderful. I've thank been to you. The National Butterfly Center twice, and if any of you out there haven't been there, I really, really recommend that you do. And uh, you're a credit to the institution. You're doing a tremendous job for them and us. Yes. So thank you. Well, thank you guys. And I'm going to let you in on something that if, if you receive our e newsletter, um, you've probably heard me mention this over the last six months or nine months. Um, if you don't, you can sign up for it on the nationalbutterflycenter.org homepage. There's a little place over on the left side where you can sign up for our e-newsletter. But we um, will be closing, hopefully on the next in the next two weeks, on another 300 plus acres of land. Mm. And... Uh, we'll be sending out notice of that. And of course, as always, we need support. This is a, a tract of land that belonged to the Nature Conservancy. 
and they abandoned it and we asked for it and they said, okay, and they're giving it to us, but we, we are having to pay for the survey and the title insurance, which is mandatory in Texas um, and, uh, and uh, the closing costs. But this is land that we will also be managing for butterflies and revegetating to some extent. How close is it? Ho to the hopefully, center? it's not a done deal. Hopefully. Hopefully, I am very hopeful. <laughs> I've been working very hard on this too. Um, it is six miles west of the National Butterfly Center. And it is all, um, I say all, there's about 30, 40 acres that were cut off behind the border wall, but the rest of the property, the 300 or so acres are in front of the border wall. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, this is Dennis. Uh, thanks everyone in particular. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, great presentation, beautiful photographs. Thank you. Uh, thanks again. Uh, yeah, just for people who, just so we know in the future, uh, Jason clearly said in the invitation and anyone who read it, you have to identify yourself in order to participate in the Zoom call. It's in the invitation. Uh, you can't get in if you don't know who you are. We don't know who you are based on some bad experience we had earlier. <laughs> so uh, in the future, when you invite people, like sure they know they need to uh, tell them they need to identify themselves. Uh, there, there's no way to do that when everything is muted. When they were in the waiting room, they had no way to let you know who they were. That was my, that was the complaint I heard. Yeah, the problem is when you 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 need to identify yourself up front. Uh, that's how, the problem. How do you? Uh, how do you do that if you are in a waiting room and you don't have mic access? Pause, 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 pause. Mm -hmm. uh, next time we will do a registration so that the people who come who want to participate will have to register ahead of time. Yeah. I can set that up through Zoom. Um, but uh, Linda, regarding how do you do that in the waiting room, um, what you do is you change your name. So you don't do like a first name basis of like Jason. You would say Jason Claiborne or you could do Jason Claiborne, Miami Blue or something like that. That would be the, you'd have to type that in when you um, are logging in. But we won't even have to worry about that because next time we'll just do the full registration. Yeah, um, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, that's excellent. So we'll yeah, we should, all of our chapters should do that. Uh, all right, uh, let's move along. Uh, I'm gonna uh, skip ahead in the agenda because Jeff, are you still on the line? I don't know if he's still there or not. Let's see. Saw his face a minute ago. It is a Jeff Blasberg, are you there? No, it looks like JPL's right. gone. He's gone. All right. Uh, so we won't skip ahead. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I was going to ask him to talk about the uh, NABA Pineland effort, but Delia, you'll take that when we get to it near the end. Uh, Patty, do you have anything to report on membership? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> In a word. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I wasn't prepared for that. All right. Uh, Linda, how about butterfly counts? Um, yes, um, several Miami Blue members and I have been going out for the last three months surveying, particularly for a butterfly that I looked for from 2004 to 2017 and didn't find, finally found it in 2017, which is a tropical buckeye. And this year there's just been an absolute explosion. There are some sites where we found more than 60 of them, some in a very, very dark form. It really has been exciting. And uh, I'm sorry we haven't been able to open it up to the chapter because of COVID, but maybe uh, next year we'll be able to do that. Um, <clears throat> another site we just recently visited was Southwest Martinez with the help of Lydia Cooney. Uh, she's with Connect to Protect and she was able to get us permission to go into Southwest Martinez. 
Um, <clears throat> it was very slow two weeks ago because of the weather. Uh, we went again yesterday and we found a larger number of species. Um, if anyone's interested, they can contact me and I can send them the list of butterflies that we found. We did find a very rare moth called a lesser wasp moth, which apparently isn't very common, which was pretty exciting. And also the faithful beauty moth. Hmm. Um, as far as the checklist status report, we finally, finally, finally uh, had the, stat of the checklist printed. We ordered a thousand copies. I've given, are going to give 200 copies to Dennis to share with Florida Parent Light who helped co-sponsor that effort. Uh, and if anyone wants checklists, um, I believe Becky is going to post on our webpage a downloadable printable checklist on the webpage. Um, sadly, you know, we're not having in-person meetings, so uh, it's difficult to distribute them. If you. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Dennis, for all your hard work for proofing and proofing and proofing and proofing. And thank you, Becky, <laughs> for finally uh, getting it to the point where we could have it printed. So it's very exciting. If you can find it on the website under the section titled Butterflies, far right at the top mast here. And it's up at the top. That's it for me. Um, okay. Uh, just some quick conservation things. Uh, many of you know Miami Wiles is the project that is being proposed uh, down uh, proximate to Zoo Miami in the Richmond Pinelands. Uh, about 10 days ago or so, the Dade County Commission and in its infinite wisdom. Uh, passed a resolution authorizing the entry of a 40-year lease that would allow uh, development of a water slide park and oh my associated um, retail and, in fact, a small uh, hotel uh, on the site. It's uh, interesting because the site is actually an old parking lot, but proximate to a lot of highly endangered properties. Uh, both the pine and the rock ones themselves and then all the creatures that use it. The sort of the, the mascot of the area is the Florida bonneted bat, which is the rarest bat in North America. And also uh, one of the few places it occurs is in that Richmond Pineland. There are a handful of other endangered species. I should say there's several handfuls of endangered species if you count plants. Uh, and they both the uh, Bartram's hair uh, scrub hair streak and the Florida leaf wing have critical habitat that butt up against the site. Uh, the leaf wing occurs there. The habitat has been extirpated, although it still is part of the critical habitat for the leaf wing. Um, so it's an ongoing fight. Uh, wearing another hat on behalf of Tropical Audubon, uh, we've been active in this, and I will probably get Miami Blue as well as soon as we figure out what we do on the other side of this resolution that was passed. I will say so all. All of you who want to know, every Dade County Commissioner voted in favor of it, except for one that's turned out, uh, 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 Javier Suarez, the only one that voted against it. All the rest voted in favor. Um, uh, it, my own political comment is it was a go, going away present for Dennis Moss, that's his uh, district, and he was turned out as well. So uh, he'll reappear as a member of the school board. Uh, but he's no longer a Dade County Commissioner as of soon. Uh, anybody that's got any questions or want to get involved, just let me know. I've spent a lot of time in this one, like on a daily basis, uh, figuring out what next steps are. I unfortunately have to say, and I say this even as a lawyer, probably the next step is litigation. Uh, we think there's some pretty good claims there. You may, if you're in Dade County long enough, remember that in 2006 there was a referendum that authorized the development of this property for a water slide, or I should say for recreational use, as, as long as it did not, quote, it was not on environmentally sensitive land. Um, I think the, our position is there's probably not any more environmentally sensitive land in Dade County than that that site that they intend to put the- uh, Can I make one quick comment about that? Can I make that? one quick Oh, sorry, because I've sure. talked to, um, okay, so word on the street, and I just want to let you know what, what we're up against. Um, 
as much as we don't want that Richmond Pine Pinelands to be developed, um, there are people in the community um, who look at this as an opportunity for jobs. Now, I don't support that. I understand um, the value of the Pineland habitat, but I, I, I would, I would like to, you know, for us who are trying to preserve these lands, um, we have to consider what we're up against. And so often it's going to come down to jobs, even if they're low paying jobs. There are a lot of people in Miami who are like, hey, you know, I can work here or this will boost the economy and stuff. So I don't, I don't necessarily know what the strategy is. I have some ideas, but I just want everybody to be aware of that there is actually support for this water park and some of the businesses that will be there because there are people in the community um, who look at this as a as a way to, to find work. So um, maybe more public outreach. I, I don't know, but that's going to be the pushback other than, as you mentioned earlier, you know, litigation. But like we, when I'm hanging out with people in Homestead uh, or in the Miami Day college community and stuff some people they do care about these habitats and others are like well i i want to work so that regarding a water park that is in the conversation that this is job opportunities for people who live in like richmond um Perrine, um in those areas homestead and stuff like that so i just want to throw that out there but i still think we should preserve all of that land if possible yeah, uh, yeah. The the political issue is uh, jobs. Yes. Uh, and yeah. That's a whole separate issue, and um, you know, it's like peace, love, and apple pie. You can't be against jobs, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, we can talk sidebar on that, Jason. Um, so anyway, that's Miami Wilds. Um, like I said, the, the county commission approved it with some friendly amendments from uh, uh, Levine Cava. Uh, the formal resolution as amended has not been made available publicly because the Dade County attorney takes two to three weeks to prepare the resolution. So we're not quite sure what we're shooting at yet uh, and uh, probably won't know for another week or so. Uh, let's see, next, uh, Carl Gables Pollinator. Uh, yeah, so uh, very recently, in the last six weeks or so, there's a site uh, on the corner of Bird Road and Toledo, right near or across the street from the uh, Presbyterian Church. The uh, uh, So really just east of the intersection of University and Granada and Bird Road. Uh, on that south side, there is a site that was acquired by uh, the city of Coral Gables. It was one of the, probably one of the few remaining vacant lots in Coral Gables. Uh, I walked over there a couple of months ago and found, actually I was doing a butterfly count, our Coral Gables butterfly count, and uh, I was homebound, or at least I wasn't out traveling, and I walked over there to do a count and got a remarkable number of butterflies and it occurred to me that maybe this could be a pollinator site since that's sort of the rage right now and should be. So I contacted Coral Gables. I asked them just to stop mowing a portion of it to see what would happen. And I think I'm up to 17 different species of butterflies right in that one little area. It's just a like a 40 foot by 50 foot rectangle. Uh, anyway, fast forward, Gables said, okay, we'll stop mowing. I said, can we put a sign up? They said, sure, as long as you provide the sign. We did that last, actually the sign was erected last Tuesday. I think a picture of it's on the website. Uh, and um, uh, the next step is to get a, a sense, it's not just of the butterflies, but the other pollinators and the plants that are just on this. It's, it's you know, it's a disturbed site. It's got a lot of um, uh, exotic uh, grasses and weeds, but it also has you know, some of the old reliables. And uh, it's a very interesting little site right in the middle of Coral Gables. And I'm trying to get the city to be more attentive to, um, more attentive to their property, in particular, what they consider to be sort of waste property or property that's not being highly utilized and getting them to be, uh, you know, just sort of leaving it alone and seeing what, what appears. And then maybe we can get some traction to make 
for pollinator sites within uh, suburbia. Um, most recently, the Carl Gables Garden Club has reached out to us to see, to want to sort of, I'll say, partnership with us in this regard. Uh, I need to talk to the president of that club, but the good news is that people like Linda Lawrence here in Carl Gables and others have been very uh, instrumental in building that bridge, both with the, the garden club and with the city. So I see it just as a small step. It's, all, it's an experiment to see how far we can take this before the city says no. Um, I hopefully it's something that we can use as a demonstration of what benign neglect <laughs> that is not mowing can produce in terms of some of these sites. Uh, again, happy to welcome anyone that wants to participate in this project. It's not that uh, strenuous. Uh, I walk, it's about three blocks from my house, so I can walk over there and in about 10 minutes do a butterfly count. Uh, and I think, Becky, we have posted the list, right, of the, spe the species list on our website. You're muted, Betty, uh, Becky, but I think I see yes. you nod your head. The list is yes. on the website. The list is on the website. One picture's yeah. up. So anyway, and, up today. and this coming week, we're going to, uh, Lydia is going to come over and we're going to do a, just look at a plant inventory and then maybe with the help of some other folks get a, uh, a bee and other insect inventory of just a little site to see what what hangs out there. So that's uh, that's the uh, Carl Gables pollinator pollinator site. And again, if anybody wants uh, to know anything, let me know. Barbara, did you want to add anything to this? Um, just that I I become I become best friends with Linda. I think we t uh, we email or, or speak on a daily basis. She is a ball of fire and really has come to uh, the conservation table in a big way. And um, I just started making some suggestions because there's a long timeline um, before this gets actually turned into a real park. It'll be three years before they start doing the planning and probably six years before it's, it's built and the plan is to, to uh, make it a pollinator garden with winding pathways and, and seeding and delightful. But there's a couple of things they could add in the meantime that would be easy if they need to, to remove it later. That would uh, just help us increase the, the number of pollinators and maybe folks will notice it while they're driving by and notice our sign and go, wow, how did you get all those butterflies on that site? So I've uh, shared that with Dennis and shared it with Linda. And uh, there's going to be an upcoming meeting with Coral Gables. Uh, I may or may not uh, talk with or speak with them. Um, Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, has worked with the city of Coral Gables on other butterfly garden projects. So we have, we do know some of the, the people there as well. And they've been our advisory uh, members on our FFL advisory committee too. So it's a good, good connection. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know Jeff Glassberg had to hop off, but Delia, if you're still on the line, could you just brief us on what I've labeled the NABA Pine Rockland's effort? Sure. So there are several aspects to the Pine Rocklands effort. One is raising visibility. The second is raising funds. And then the third will be the actual implementation. For the raising visibility, we have um, begun the process of developing a specific identity for the project in conjunction with Forethought Marketing. They're the marketing firm local to Miami that is doing this on a pro bono basis as their passion project because they feel so strongly about its importance. We don't have the logo, the logo just yet. Uh, we're expecting that soon. We are working with the tagline, keep the wonder alive, which is so great at so many different levels. So uh, expect more on that as it becomes available. Uh, we were also very fortunate in our efforts in conjunction with the American Society of Landscape Architects, 
which was to have had their annual national conference in Miami this year uh, for lots of reasons related to COVID-19. That has gone virtual. And as part of the virtual effort, they decided to do a video session on Pine Rocklands. Uh, we, NABA, uh, were involved, as was Tiffany Melvin and Christine Oliveta at uh, the Miami-Dade Eel Program. And we did that at the Rockdale Preserve. We have not seen that video yet. Um, it'll all come down to how it's edited, but hopefully it will talk about the Pine Rockland, how important an ecosystem it is, and how important the ecosystem is to butterflies. If it is edited the way we hope it is, that is something that we will be able to leverage and put up on websites, et cetera. Uh, related to the effort is obviously fundraising. We have gotten the first samples of the t-shirts that we're using Kim Heist designs on. One is Save the Florida Leaf Wing. We've got two versions of that. One actually in big letters says Save the Florida Leaf Wing. And then the image that Kim has painted of the Florida Leaf Wing. The other is the image only and under that North American Butterfly Association, nava.org. Similarly for Bartram Scrub Hair Streak, two versions, save the Bartram Scrub Hair Streak with the image. And then the other is a huge image of the butterfly. Uh, we are also going to be launching a GoFundMe campaign to actually acquire the land that we discussed last time. Uh, we've got Mike Cerboni up in New Jersey working on a couple of the IT issues to make that happen. And we may be able to launch both the t-shirt campaign and the GoFundMe campaign as early as this week. As soon as they go live and I have URLs, Dennis, I'll let you and others in the club know so that you can disseminate it among your members. Um, I think that's it. If anybody has any questions, happy to answer them. Hi. Um, Hi. It, it's Barbara. Hi. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> I guess your iPad, I don't see your- I am your... iPad, yes. Okay, was... gotcha, gotcha. Um, I just, uh, Patty also um, sat in on a lot of the Pine Rockland Working Group presentations that took place over, it was last week for the presentations and this week was um, mainly the field, field trips. trips. Yep. Yes, and uh, I, ha I can direct you, I can share actually, um, Institute for Regional Conservation just uh, put out their monthly newsletter. Yes, it arrived yesterday and I can forward that to you because it has all of the links and you might find some of that interesting.